Okay. Um, so that's where we were. Um, uh, and I just want to add, so Freddy just mentioned that everybody was talking about the lenticular cloud above the Mont Blanc this morning. In fact, I think walking to the breakfast, at least five people told me, there's a cloud on the Mont Blanc, and I was already taking pictures from my room. Um, so I added a slide just to show uh, the lenticular cloud, and maybe we can discuss this a little more. Um, okay, but that's going to be the uh, at the end, once we've gone through the rest of the physics. First, we have to go back to um, through the physics of moist convection. So actually yesterday, a little loud. Yesterday we pretty much went as far as we could without talking about condensation. We did start adding moisture to account for virtual effects. The fact that if you have water vapor in air, it's, it's uh, lighter. And we saw that you could go back to the framework of dry convection by only changing the temperature using virtual temperature. So that's nice. But once you have condensation, we have another degree of complexity that we have to account for. And um, so we saw that. And so here, I have to talk about this phase change, this uh, um, condensation of water vapor. So how many of you have heard that warm air can hold more water vapor than cold air? Yeah. So this is what I call the sponge theory. And I want to spend some time discussing this sponge theory. So, and I have to say, this is from the book by Oren and Albrecht. It's uh, very nicely discussed. Um, so actually, this is a nice image, and it's an easy way to remember that if you have warm air, it's going to be harder to condense its water vapor. If you have cold air, it's easier. And the shortcut is to say that cold air can hold less water vapor before it starts to saturate in water vapor and start condensing into droplets. As we saw yesterday, if it's water vapor, it's not a cloud, you don't see water vapor. You start seeing it when you reach saturation, and the water vapor becomes liquid or ice. Okay, so um, it's a nice shortcut, but it's not what happens. Air is not some kind of sponge in which you, know, you have water vapor holes, and until you saturate those holes, you can hold water vapor, but then once the holes are filled, it becomes liquid. That's not how it works. There's a lot of vacuum between the molecules, obviously. And in fact, it has nothing to do with air. You can put anything above. So I'm going to take a surface of liquid water. And then look at what happens here. So I have molecules of water vapor. Here I have liquid, wat uh, liquid water. And the fact you, that you also have oxygen or um, other air molecules has nothing to do with the saturation. You could put any gas. Obviously, it doesn't change anything. This saturation curve, and I didn't tell you what you're looking at, this is the, um, the theoretical curve from Close this Clapper, and we will not derive it. It is in the classical textbooks, and I'm happy to discuss this offline if you want. But the nice thing about the um, saturation curve is that it is theoretical. We have an actual equation for it. So this is something very well understood since Close this and Clapper, and what it tells you is that this saturation uh, partial pressure of water vapor, if you remember E, was the partial pressure of water vapor. Remember that? Are you on the scary slides with all the definitions? No, that's good. Okay, so an ES denotes to the saturation one. So it means if you have a certain partial pressure of water vapor, y you increase it. Uh, you can increase it as long as you are below this saturation value. This is the maximum value uh, before saturation. And then once you, you reach ES, the saturation partial pressure, the water vapor um, start to condense. That's when you form clouds. And so, so the equation tells you it's only a function of temperature. Hence, the uh, warm air can hold more water vapor. But saturation, um, saturation water vapor, this curve here, is mainly the curve of equilibrium between condensation and evaporation. So what I mean is that if here E is smaller than ES, what happens in reality is I have both evaporation and condensation, okay? And if E is smaller than ES, basically you're not in equilibrium between those two. If, um, similarly, if E is larger than ES, you're not in equilibrium. So if E is larger than ES, you have more condensation. If E is smaller than ES, then you have more evaporation. <coughs> and then when E is equal to ES, uh, condensation and evaporation 
are in equilibrium, so in the net, nothing happens. Okay, so if you, if you have a smaller amount of water vapor than saturation, it evaporates. Intuitively, it makes sense. If you have a larger amount, you have more condensation. And then um, if it's equal, it's in equilibrium. Nothing happened in the net. Things happen, but in the net, there's no change. Uh, does that make sense? And it does make more sense than the sponge theory, I think. Um, another sort of intuition of uh, on uh, why it depends on temperature. So why I'm going to concentrate on evaporation. We have a similar picture for condensation. What makes the liquid water here evaporate? Oh, and I should add, this is the equilibrium between evaporation and condensation for a flat surface of liquid water. This is the formal definition of the closest Clapeyron term, the saturation term. Okay, so what dictates the amount of liquid molecules that will make it to the gas phase, that can escape the liquid phase? Yes. Yeah, and so why do you expect this to depend on temperature? Exactly. We saw yesterday, when I was uh, at the beginning trying to relate to uh, David's lecture, we saw yesterday that the temperature is proportional to what I called the, the kinetic energy associated with moisture that does not go anywhere. If you remember, this is the departure from the velocity of the center of mass, of whatever volume or parcel you're looking at. The higher the temperature, the more chances uh, there is that those liquid molecules will escape. So it does make sense that this thing increases with temperature. Okay, so I won't say much more, but um, this is just to clarify, the bottom line is that if you're happy with the sponge theory, actually I've used it quite a lot, it's convenient, and it's a, it's a nice shortcut to remember. Warm air has a higher saturation point than cold air. Um, okay, so now we can start seeing why convection, why clouds, sorry, are associated with upward motion. As the air ascends above the Mont Blanc, the air ascends, it gets cooler. If it gets cooler, the saturation point decreases dramatically. This is almost exponential. If it decreases, it means that um, whatever amount of water vapor you have, um, it's going to be less and less likely to stay in the water vapor state, and it's going to start to condense, and that's going to give you a cloud. So that's everything comes down to this curve, this closest Clapeyron equation. And uh, one small remark. So I said it's good because we have a theoretical understanding. We have an equation that we can write. So yes, it's good. But the bad thing is, as I said, it's almost exponential. It's not exactly exponential because you have a 1 over t squared. But it's almost an exponential increase with temperature. Now with warming, um, the Earth, the atmospheric uh, humidity will increase dramatically. And that's something that we started measuring, that's something that climate models predict, and that's something that we understand from basic physics. And that means a lot of things for precipitation extremes and um, the hydrological cycle in general. So it's not such a good news, but at least we have a physical understanding of what's going on. Okay, so um, now we're ready for moist convection. Any question on this? Yes, you can, of course. Yeah, so mm, another gas. That's why I didn't say, yeah, another gas. That's true. Yes. And in fact, if you have more, uh, if you want to discuss this in more detail, I will refer to Freddie. <laughs> you can go talk to him. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's why I put another gas. That's a good point. Uh, I was trying to go quickly, but I just wanted to motivate the fact that physically it doesn't make sense to talk about, you know, holes in air. Molecules have a lot of space between them. You probably all are aware of this. Okay, so now we're ready for moist convection. When the original question is, when is it, uh, the atmosphere unstable to moist convection? And as usual, we're going to try to be clever and try to go back to something we know, which is dry convection. And if you remember, what's the first thing we did for dry convection? We looked for something that was conserved. Okay, we always like something conserved. We like energy. Yeah, we saw this in, the, in the, the other lectures. We like something that's conserved. That's something that we can... Um, use and so we're going to try to do this it turns out that for moist convection you can have something conserved but it's approximate so i'll happily do the approximation 
And if you're unhappy with this, if you're more um, mathematician, we can discuss under what conditions that's true. We can even estimate the error that you make. Um, okay, so um, maybe I'll do this a little more slowly because you haven't seen it yet. So here, what changes? Actually, I shouldn't have put the slide. What changes? How did we start for potential temperature? Yes, the first law of thermodynamics. So we have that CV dt is minus P V alpha. So that's the work. That's the internal energy. And then we have the heat added. And we said this was zero because it's an adiabatic displacement. Now what happens when the water changes phases, and I'm going to assume that my parcel is saturated. Okay, so we're doing, we're doing this in step. We want something conserved. If it changes between unsaturated to saturated, it's a little more complicated. So let's start first, it's saturated, and then we'll see we can extend that easily. Okay, so if the parcel is saturated, um, what happens to this uh, equation? What other term do I have? Well, I have the latent heat, right? And the latent heat um, is given by the change in the, do you remember what that is, by the way? QV or QS? Specific humidity, but maybe I should. So it's a specific humidity. Do you remember how it's defined? by the total, right? Remember, sp specific means per mass for obscure reasons. But so it per it's per mass, and so you have your V. And here I'm assuming then that the specific humidity is, is equal to the saturation specific humidity. Which I denote QS. I should use the same notations, actually, so what do they call it? QS, yes. Um, okay, so the classic slab and I give you ES, but you can derive QS from it because you have a relationship between rho V and, and the partial pressure. What's the relationship between E and, and uh, rho V? The ideal gas law, right? You have E is rho V or V T. And so similarly, you have a relationship for the saturation values. So if you have a satura the saturation pressure, you can deduce the saturation um, specific humidity. Okay, and so if the water vapor amount decreases, that's a warming, so I have a minus sign. And LV is the amount of heat in the right units that you get from the condensation of one unit of water vapor. Okay, so this is uh, the coefficient between the change in your water vapor that has condensed and the heat that it releases. So the latent heat, it's called the latent heat of condensation or, yeah. Sometimes the latent heat of vaporization, that's why it's denoted LV. But the latent heat is really released during condensation. During uh, evaporation, you have latent cooling. Okay, that, that's the only change, yes. What is the system? Oh, again, this parcel. I didn't draw the parcel yet. Uh, I didn't draw it. So again, I take a parcel um, near the surface. This is my atmosphere. And the big question that I'm trying to answer is when is the atmosphere stable or unstable? And I have a certain profile of temperature. And so we use the parcel method. So we take a parcel in the boundary layer, we raise it adiabatically, assuming there's some kind of you know, large-scale forcing, something that makes it go up. And the question is, does it keep going up yielding a thunderstorm, or does it go back down because the atmosphere is stable? Yeah. This is, this is, so here I have, this is the energy that is released. 
when the parcel uh, goes higher and higher, and more and more of the water vapor condenses, this is the latent heat that is released and is warming the parcel. Make sense? So here I'm assuming the parcel is saturated for simplicity. We will make this more general in a second. Okay, so we take this parcel, we raise it. It's saturated and the temperature decreases with height, so it's going to saturate more and more. And then we have latent heat released. Note <coughs> sorry, note here that mathematically, actually, if the temperature were to increase, this would be a, a negative term because you could have also evaporation. So I'm not. This is the net condensation, the net latent heat. So it's assuming here that once the saturation has occurred, um, all the water, liquid water, falls. I'm not taking it into account. Okay, that's an approximation that I'm happy to make because I just want the leading order. But there are more complex um, formulations where you would keep the condensates that form as you go up. Um, okay, so this was the hard part. Then the math you can do, I'm just going to turn to the slides. But any more questions on this? All right, so this is the equation that we just wrote. And just like yesterday, we can massage this to put it in terms of pressure. We could have started actually from the low in pressure and temperature form. Yes? Yes, to come and, and uh, feed. That's right. So that's true. So I'm assuming that it's, yes, you're right, that there's a source of liquid nearby so that it can evaporate. Yes. I'm assuming here that QV stays always equal to QS. And so indeed, if it's uh, condensing, it's losing its liquid. But conversely, if it's, um, eva if it's uh, evaporating, um, no, I think that's fine, right? Yeah. Well, I'm assuming, that in, in any case, I'm assuming that the large scale always manages to keep QV equal to QS. But in reality, what happens is, is condensation of its... Uh, it's a uh, water vapor and the liquid falls. Liquid, yes, yes. Here I'm taking, so here notice that I'm taking the dry approach. This is the, uh, I'm, I'm seeing the dry parcel and the water vapor as a forcing in the diabetic term. Okay, I'm seeing the water vapor as something external that is carried with the parcel and it does add heat when it changes phase. But I'm seeing it as the you know right hand side. Yes. Yeah. And you have several ways, and that's what gives rise to all those different energies. You can look at the dry, seeing the moisture as a forcing, latent heat, or you can have a moisture uh, variable. Then you get the moist static energy, and we get there. But in that case, the right hand side, the water vapor is on the right hand side, so I see it as a forcing. Because I'm trying to relate to the dry case. I'm trying to stay as close as I can to what we already did. OK, and so as before, we can massage this and get this. And then on the right-hand side, I've divided by CPT. And so this is when um, I have to do an approximation. So we get that D of log T over P R, R of CP. So you, you recognize this. What is this? potential temperature, and we had zero, but now we have minus LV over CPT dQS. Okay, and I would like to write this as D of something equals zero. What's the problem? Here I don't have D of something, I have a one over temperature. So I'm going to assume it, that D of 1 over T, D of QS is roughly equal to D of QS over T. And in fact, with all the factors, I could keep everything. Okay, why can I do that? I'm not going to put numbers, but actually the changes in temperature, the relative changes in temperature are, are much smaller than the relative changes in specific humidity. That's because changes in, in temperature may be our order a Kelvin, the temperature itself is 300 Kelvin. It's a large value. So the relative changes are small. And so the error that you make is less than you know 10% in the lower atmosphere. And well, it depends on the altitude, but it's not, it's not critical for what I want to um, talk about today. 
But something to keep in mind, there is an approximation here. That's the price that we have to pay to have our conserved variable. And then if we do that, we get the d of log of t pr over cp exponential lv qs over cpt equals zero. Far so good. Yes. Why what? Oh, we should use virtual temperature. I just made it simple. I'm making approximations because, again, it's the leading order picture. So, if you really want to be specific, this should be virtual temperature. But I think there's enough subscripts. Um, the it wouldn't change much, and it's more accurate if you use virtual temperature. So we should. Yes. In fact, in the plot that I'll show later, I'll always say uh, potential temperature, equivalent potential temperature, but really because we're comparing density, it should be virtual. But now you all know what that is, and so you, yeah. So that's a good remark, it should be virtual. For simplicity here, I'm just using temperature. Um, okay, and so if the log of something is conserved, something is conserved, and so you have a new variable, which is um, called the equivalent potential temperature, is the potential temperature times this exponential of um, something related to the amount of water vapor. Okay, so here we showed that if Q is equal to QS, then this is conserved. What happens if it's not saturated? Well, if you're not saturated, um, maybe I don't have to write that down. If it's not saturated, um, QV is conserved not saturated, there's no condensation, you're carrying your water vapor with you, there's no reason why it should change, neglecting you know, other sources or sinks. But there's no condensation, so there's no sink of water vapor, so QV is conserved. And so if you do the math, in all cases, QV is conserved. And so regardless of whether the parcel is saturated or not, this expression with QV in the exponential is conserved. Yes? Okay, so we have a new uh, conserved quantity and now we're good. We can talk about instability and we'll do this in a, th in a second. First I want, as, as before for the dry case, we have a low hanging fruit. And so just if you do the hydrostatic approximation on top of this, you can define another, um, another variable which is conserved. If you add the hydrostatic approximation, which is the most static energy. And the derivation is the same as before. I won't do it unless, do you want me to do it? My setting energy. Again, if one person wants to see this, we'll do it. No, you're happy? Okay, so um, I won't do it, but the, the idea is the same. So this was the um, left hand side that we had, and now we just have this minus LDQ. And so the uh, moist static energy is simply the dry static energy, CPT plus GZ, and then you have this extra term LVQ. It's very straightforward to show. In fact, you you have free time this afternoon, so you should try to derive this. It's going to be your first homework. Okay, so potential energy is conserved. Equivalent, yes. Yes, this is the approximation that we made. Yes, good question. Uh, this. Um, this is the approximation that we made, and. No, no. This is the, the main approximation that we, we made. Um, okay. Okay, so now how do we know if the atmosphere is stable or unstable? And then, um, so I have to walk you through these uh, skew T diagrams. They look a little scary, but they're not so bad. So let me slowly walk you through the different curves that you're looking at. I want to mention, I took this from the COMET program, which is an online program with a lot of um, online modules, online courses. It's uh, free. Um, it's done in by UCAR, I think. It's uh, free, you just have to sign up with your email. And there's a lot of lectures on tropical convection, there's a, a whole lecture on skew diagrams. It's, very, it's a very nice resource and I uh, highly, highly recommend it. I use it in my lectures all the time. And I'll use various uh, illustrations from their program in the lecture here as well. <coughs> 
Okay, so this QT diagram, so to know if uh, the atmosphere is stable or not, um, um, meteorologists use those type of, of diagrams, and um, why is it called QT? Because here you see the temperature, and the lines of constant temperature are skewed to the right. Okay, so that means that, for instance, oh, and the r I should say the red here, the red uh, curve, is the observed uh, atmospheric temperature. And just from this curve, I can tell you whether this profile is stable or not. Okay, and I need another information, which is uh, the dew point temperature, and that's the green uh, curve. Okay, so the green is the dew point temperature, and this is the actual temperature. And I'll show you how we can now say whether this is stable or unstable. But before, what are those curves? So these are ISO temperatures. So for instance, this point here has a temperature of minus 20. Why do we slant the uh, ISO temperatures to at about 45 degrees. Well, the temperature decreases really strongly with height, right? And so if I were to draw the um, temperature outside with the temperatures, the ISO temperatures vertical, I'd need a really long page because I'd have to go to really cold temperatures. And so it's just a matter of trying to fit everything on one page. Okay, so far, so good. All right, so now uh, what are the other curves? You see here, you see curves. Uh, which are dry adiabats, so it's theta equals constant. These are the, the um, profiles, and in fact, you see in the boundary layer, we know that theta is pretty much constant. We saw yesterday that convection is very efficient at mixing things uh, towards a neutral profile. And you recover it here, the environmental profile pretty much follows um, those dry adiabats. Yeah? Okay, and then you have the so-called moist adiabats, which are the adiabats that you uh, follow when you're saturated. So it's theta E equals constant. And theta E is co equals constant are those curves. And there's a few things to note. So first, see how the dry adiabat has a temperature which decreases faster than the moist adiabat. Can you all see the lines? I know the projector is, yeah, okay. So the, the moist adiabats decrease much slower than the dry adiabats. Why is that? Does that make sense? Yeah. If you are on a dry adiabat, it decreases fast. But if you're on a moist adiabat, you have the latent heat that's helping you, and so it does not decrease as fast. Another thing is if you look at the difference between the dry and the moist as a function of the temperature, here the moist is closer and closer to the slope of the dry. Does that make sense? Yeah. Why? Because when it's colder, you have less water vapor from the clouds you on. And so the latent heat effect will be smaller and smaller. And similarly, if you go to higher altitude, the asymptotes to the same slope. And again, that makes sense. There's no more water vapor. Okay, so, so far, it is that clear for everyone? If it's not clear, I'm happy to cover this again. Good. Okay, so now, um, how do we use this to determine whether the atmosphere is stable or not? We'll use our, our usual, usual method, the parcel method. So we take a parcel near the surface, usually in the boundary layer, but let's take it at the surface, and then we raise it. Now, um, yes? Yes, the, the, this one? Oh, here? Uh, no, that's theoretical. No, because you're assuming that QV is the saturation. Yeah, it's in saturation. Um, yes. The red one? Oh, the x-axis is the, the range of temperatures. Yeah, so, and this is the measured temperature. So, for instance, at uh, 500 Ectopascals, do you know what height that is, approximately? Yeah, four or five kilometers height. And so at five kilometers, the temperature measured by whatever instrument they had is, and then I have to go along the ISO temperatures, it's about minus eight degrees. In situ temperature, yes. Yes. Yeah, the red curve is the in situ temperature. And that's what we're trying to investigate this in-situ temperature, is this profile stable or unstable? Okay, so we take a parcel near the surface and we raise it. And at some point, its water vapor reaches 
saturation and it starts to condense. And so what happens to this, and this is by the way called the lifted condensation level, the place where it starts to condense. So that wha what will the parcel do? Will, will it follow, which line will it follow? Yeah, I, I didn't tell you how you know, but there's a way to know. So I'll come back to this. I just want to, yes, I'll come back to this. This is a good question. I was going to hide it under the carpet, but since you asked, I won't. Okay, so let's say I know by some mysterious reason that this is where the condensation starts to occur. I follow the a dry adiabat because I didn't have any phase change, but now there's uh, condensation, there's latent heat. And we just showed that theta E is conserved, so I'm going to be on a moist adiabat. This is what the parcel will do. Right? And because there is some inertia, so very often when it reaches the so-called equilibrium level, this is the place where it's, now its temperature is, e is equal to the environment, so it should be neutrally buoyant, but it did have some, some velocity, so it keeps going a little bit and then it goes down. So you do have some overshooting, like we saw in the time-lapse videos. We do did see some overshooting and then the envel cloud spreading. Okay, so dry adiabat until it condenses. Then it follows the moist adiabat, and then you know above the equilibrium level, it's less clear. It should stop theoretically. Yeah. Yes. 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 So what's the so? Take take your parcel here, and say it's lifted along a dry adiabat. It starts to condense, and then it follows the moist adiabat. Now again, for instability, the question which I hadn't asked yet is. Is this parcel stable or unstable? Namely, is it going to keep going along this moist adiabat happily? Or is it too heavy and is it going to go back down? Another way to say this is, is the convection going to grow deep and give you a cumulonimbus? Or is it go going to be shallow and give you a stratocumulus or shallow cumulus? How do you know whether this parcel here is stable or unstable? It's warmer. Now we're comparing things at the same temperature, so we can. Okay. Again, the only problem we have in, in, uh, in uh, thermodynamics is that we have two variables. But here, the pressure, we don't have to worry about it because we've compared things at the same pressure. So I can decently compare those two curves. It's warmer. So it keeps going. Yes. Exactly. Yes, and so here, this is where this is tricky, and this is why we don't see clouds everywhere in the atmosphere, because here we have something which is, here it's neutral, in the sense that if I, m if I move my parcel, its temperature is exactly equal to the environment. So it's just neutral, it's going to stay there. In reality, actually, uh, you may have some inhibition, in the sense that the parcel will be actually colder, and will come back down. So you could have a stable boundary layer. And that's what's pre preventing the convection from happening. And then you need to bring enough energy to your parcel to have it raised to this place. And what's in here, it can start convecting. Okay, so here there's no inhibition. That's why the place where you start to condense is the same place as um, the level at which you start to convect. Okay, if you have inhibition, you might have to first reach condensation to help you a little bit, keep going. And then eventually your temperature will be warmer with the help of the latent heat and you'll start to convect. So those two places are not necessarily equal. For simplicity here, they are. And I, um, and so that's why, for instance, mountains can help. Right? Mountains will help you raise uh, a parcel which may not necessarily be buoyantly unstable, but mechanically it's forced to go up. And once it starts to condense, you have chances that it might go unstable. Depends on what the parcel would then see above it, obviously. If the air is very warm, it won't be able to pierce, but if it's cold enough, then it will keep going. Okay, so the key thing in all this is this area here, this orange area. And we won't show it here because you'll see it in, in Davis' lectures, but this area is actually um, related to the potential energy, the convective available potential energy which is the energy, the potential energy that the parcel um, uses to, uh, to gain kinetic energy, to move, to go up. Okay, and so this is easy to derive. I'll let David do this. If you want to see it, if you really can't wait, uh, come talk to me at the end of the lecture and we can go through it. It's not hard to see. Okay, so the available potential energy is exactly this area here. 
And this is the energy that's converted from potential to kinetic as the parcel goes up. Questions? I see a lot of puzzled faces. Yes. Mm-hmm. Haha. -ha. Okay. Uh, let's do some other examples. Uh, the, the answer is yes, it stays saturated because the temperature decreases. Yes. <laughs> um, now, let's see here, I have the profile which is something like this. And I guess these are my dry adiabats and these are the moist adiabats. Okay, let's say I take a parcel and it's already saturated. What's going to happen? Yes, it's just going to follow the moist adiabat, so it's going to be even more going to be even more, I shouldn't use uh, red, I guess, yellow. Okay. It's going to be even more unstable because this area here, which is the available energy to be converted into kinetic energy, is larger. Okay, and so that's why if you have a, a moist anomaly, you tend to have to um, initiate convection. If you want moist anomalies are just as efficient as mountains to help convection occurring. And there's a bunch of papers on what are the precursors to deep convection in various areas. Uh, Steve Sherwood um, has worked on this. He has a paper. If you're interested, have other references on the precursors to convection. And now you have all the physical luggage or toolbox to understand why the, those precursors work. So, okay, um, when you're above the Mont Blanc, you've noticed that the clouds that we had uh, this morning were kind of flat, something like this. So that's an indication that actually, so what, ha what happened? Do you think the atmosphere is stable or unstable? Stable, right? If it were unstable, what happens is that the air has been mechanically forced uh, to go up the mountain and cool. It reached saturation. But even with saturation, I don't know what the temperature looks like, but even with saturation, the temperature of the parcel was not sufficient to go unstable and convect. Okay, so um, probably you see a stratification which is quite strong actually above that. Yeah. But then it depends on the large scale, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we, we'll talk a little bit about so I'll talk more about the large scales because that was my part of the lecture, but we'll talk about inversions. Um, so f I don't know if um, I'm digressing too much, but there's a, an important phenomenon that actually dictates whether convection goes deep or remains shallow, and it's called inversion. And it's when temperature uh, is, uh, when temperature has an in inversion somewhere. So it's actually a, a well-chosen name for once. So if you have a decrease of temperature, and say here the temperature increases. So actually, do I still have my drawing? Let's do this. You have something like this, and then the temperature increases and then decreases. So this is your inversion layer. What happens is that your your uh, parcel will have a hard time piercing through that because you have a very very stable y layer here. We saw that to be neutral, you need you need the temperature to uh, not de not increase, but decrease at a rate of minus g over Cp. And so if the temperature increases, you're not stable, you're super stable. Right? The, the, the neutral profile is actually a negative slope, so if you have a positive slope, you're extremely stable. And the convection will have the, harder, uh, the hardest time piercing through that. Kay. So we'll, di we'll discuss a little bit where why we have inversions, especially in the subtropics where we saw that we have, we have these deserted regions with very little clouds, little deep clouds. You know, the descent regions where we always have those shallow clouds, not deep clouds. It's because the descent um, yields a very warm and stable atmosphere. Okay, and actually now I could ask, I'm definitely digressing too much, digressing too much. 
Um, but why do you think it's very warm and stable when there's descent, large scale descent? Yeah, it's compressing the air, it's warming, and that makes the atmosphere very stable aloft. And that's why we saw all those shadow clouds in the descending bridge of the Hadley Sun. Okay, end of the very long parentheses. And, um, okay, just to show you what happens. Um, oh, I should have asked something before. Okay, here, the question is, when do you start to see a cloud? Just show you, show you the result, but um, where do you start to see a cloud? When it starts to condense, so at the LFC, right? So uh, dynamically, this is what it looks like. You have your parcel that is raised for some reason mountain, water vapor in flux, something. And so it starts to go up along the dry adiabat, which is saturation. That's when you start to see your droplets. It follows a moist adiabat. And then here, when it reaches its equilibrium level, it stops going up and it spreads horizontally. Um, okay, so before I move on to the various, to the life cycle of an individual thunderstorm, I have to open another parenthesis because I had a question. How do you know this is the level where it starts to condense? I haven't talked about this curve here, the dew point. Okay, so this is the dew point, um, this is the dew point uh, temperature. And there are other lines that I haven't mentioned, those little green lines, I don't know if you can see them. Can you see them? These are lines of constant saturation mixing ratio. Okay, and so what happens is that, see here how um, you follow the constant saturation mixing ratio and here, um, the saturation mixing ratio here is, okay, the dew point, sorry, is the temperature at which you have to decrease your parcel to reach saturation, right? So this is the, um, this is the saturation mixing ratio corresponding to this temperature. Now, if I raise this parcel here, it's, it's keeping its, uh, its uh, humidity with it because there's no condensation until it condenses. And here, its, its humidity is equal to the humidity of this point here, by definition, of the dew point. Does that make sense? Kind of? So again, this is, um, the dew point temperature is the temperature at which the parcel is saturated. So here we have that the water vapor of the parcel is the saturation water vapor of this point. The isoline of saturation water vapor are, um, are here. And so here, we know that the, the water vapor of the parcel, which has been conserved, is equal to the saturation water vapor. Now you see why I didn't want to talk about it. I could write equations, but we can talk about it offline. offline. Okay, but the bottom line is that the saturation amount is given to you by the dew point, following those white or green lines. And when, when they intersect the actual temperature, this is when the moisture here is equal to the saturation moisture. Okay, so that's how you know. That's why you have this little white uh, curve. Okay, it's not clear. It's normal. Moist convection usually does that. But um, again, we can talk about the details online. Okay, so I want to move on to the um, life cycle of clouds. Um, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, you move the dew point to the right. <laughs> yes, and in fact, when I, yes. Yeah, because this is, so basically this distance between the green and the red tells you the distance to saturation. It's the temperature difference between your actual temperature in red and the temperature where you would have saturation in green. So this distance tells you how, uh, um, yes, yes. So that I was going to draw. So if you, yes, if you if you add moisture, um, what happens? I'm just going to do the bottom part. If you add moisture, means that the only information about moisture on these on these graphs is the dew point temperature. You move the dew point temperature closer to your temperature because you're closer to saturation. You have more water vapor with you. So that's what it does. And that also helps, obviously, um, convection because then you, you will start, your LFC will be lower and you will start being on your moist adiabat faster. Yeah. Yes. There is. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes, th that's uh, actually it's not the causality. The, the thing is, you follow a dry adiabat until you reach the LFC, and then you follow a moist adiabat. So that's why it's, it's where you switch. It's not really the intersect, but you switch from following a theta equals constant to theta e equals constant. Because here, y the first law tells you that your temperature only changes by pressure work. And here it tells you it changes by pressure work, but also by latent heat release. Okay, so this is a th another term in the, this is just the addition of a term in the first law of thermodynamics. Makes you change curve. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it represents the distance to saturation at each different level. Yeah. Again, this is the distance to saturation. Maybe that was the best way to actually say it quickly. This is the distance to saturation, and as you go up, this distance decreases because this follows the constant saturation humidity curves, and, and this one just follows the environmental temperature. Yes? No, no, no. Here I was assuming QV is equal to QS, but then we showed that actually it's conserved. So it's actually a, a good question that I get quite often. But then we showed that if even at the bottom, QV is not equal to QS, but QV is conserved because there's no condensation. Um, and so that's why, but here again, we're interested in the density and the density is given by theta before you start to condense and then theta E after you condense. So these are the relevant curves. More questions? Yes. It's the uh, it's the environmental atmosphere. So if you send balloons. Yes. Yes. Or or a parcel near the bottom that's forced up. So basically this is how meteorologists dictate or decide whether there's a severe thunderstorm coming or if the weather is gonna be nice. Cape Cape is used, um, still used to predict a lot of uh, the um, weather patterns or weather uh, alerts that you get. <coughs> so basically, you measure the atmospheric temperature, you measure the tem the atmospheric dew point, and from this you can deduce what the Cape is, and so you know whether it's going to be. And actually, the worst thing is when you have a lot of inhibition. So here, there's none because the, the uh, profile is neutral. But the, if the profile is very stable at the bottom and you have a lot of instability above, what happens? It's very stable, so it's very hard for a parcel to pierce, right? So it's gonna stay quiet for a long time. But then at some point, the parcel will make it. And there has been a lot of time for, for available potential energy to pile up. And that's when you have very, very extreme thunderstorms. Okay, and... Uh, so the life cycle, now you've seen it all, I just want to mention the end because we haven't really talked about the dissipating stage of the clouds, more the formation. There's something interesting in the, in the, dissipa in the dissipating stage. <coughs> so here you see the formations, I have to wait. Yeah, you see the formation, so you have some convergence, some mountains, some moisture anomaly, uh, whatever moves the boundary layer parcel to reach its level of free convection. Then it starts to go up, reaches the equilibrium level, and spreads. Then what happens? The droplets in the cloud grow larger and larger, they start to precipitate. <coughs> and as they precipitate, there's two effects. The first one is that the drops entrain air with them, and so it creates this gravity current, this cold descending current below the cloud. We've all experienced this, right? W when it's been raining, it's usually colder. But it's not only because you have um, pooling of air that you have this descent and that it's cold mainly. Um, why is it cold? Why do you think it's cold? You say, yeah, par part of the air will evaporate. And s you know, when, you, when you condense, you have latent heat. When you evaporate, you have latent cooling. And that's a very um, efficient way of cooling the air. <coughs> and so that creates the so-called cold pools at the end of the, of the um, uh, cloud life. So these are cold pools of air that spread below the clouds. There's a, um, quite a lot of research uh, those years on properties of cold pools and how actually they help generate other cells because if you have a cold pool spreading, you see that you can mechanically force the air nearby to now go up. And so that tends to trigger new cells nearby. So 
there's quite a lot of research on this. Okay, and in fact, this was the, uh, and I should say, this is still from this website, the Comet module that I recommended. And this was the life cycle of an individual uh, cloud. Uh, it's called single cell. And so this is typically what it looks like. It's not very clear, actually, but this is an image that I found when I Googled single cell. So you probably can do better, Google single cell. <coughs> this is a multi-cell. So this is when you have upward motion, you have a developing uh, cloud. And then next to it, you have a, um, a new cell forming. And the reason is you have those cold pools. You see here, remember this, this is a front. This is actually the cold pool spreading. This is a cold front, <coughs> now in the vertical. And the cold pool spreads and it's going to force, if you have background wind, it can force upward motion. And so what you have is a, a large anvil cloud within, it, within um, which you have a lot of cells at different um, stages of their life. Typically, you have a dissipating stage next to a developing stage. And that's because the cold pool interacts with the background wind and generates new cells. Uh, there is, there is, and uh, we'll come back. So this is a single, this lecture is on a single thunderstorm, but then they can organize. And so that's when the cloud feedbacks on the large scale, on the mesoscale, and then it helps convection in the nearby environment. And that tends to help convection organize spatially and give you mesoscale convective systems or cyclones. Yeah, but it's not, um, yeah. Not everything is known about this mesoscale organization, so it deserves a whole other lecture. But yeah, there's mechanisms. <coughs> this is more a local thunderstorm that can, you know, grow a little bit, but still not at the mesoscale scale. <coughs> Sorry. And then you have the um, the king of all cells, the supercell, <coughs> and that's uh, that's when the updraft starts to rotate. And I should say, so this is typically in low wind, low wind environments, low wind shear in, in particular. <coughs> here you have some wind, as you can see here, actually some shear. And typically here, this is when you have strong vertical shear. And this is a schematic uh, where you have a strong vertical shear. So you see the wind increasing with height. And so what happens, you see that this wind shear is associated with some vorticity, right? Actually, I, I, I think I went the wrong direction. It's this way. You have some low level vorticity. And that can generate some vortex tubes in the boundary layer. <coughs> now, if for some reason you have upward motion, it's going to um, tilt those vertex tubes and generate vertical um, rotating updrafts. That's typical of the supercells. And these are actually quite um, dangerous. They are um, associated with strong events. And then you see you have tornadoes, um, hail, shelf clouds, a lot of uh, precipitation, very intense precipitation. And they can be very damaging. They are associated or they occur in a very strong shared environment for the reasons that are uh, schematized here. Okay, so that's it for the cloud formation, at least for deep clouds. Uh, basically, we saw when, when you have a parcel and you raise it, when is the atmosphere unstable? And for by deep cloud, I mean the clouds that have significant vertical extent, so the nimbus stratus and the cumulonimbus the ones that actually start to precipitate. But I haven't really told you how those other shallow clouds form. There are, um, there are other mechanisms, and so I want to go through the processes maybe a little faster. Um. <coughs> so the key thing, as we mentioned, to know whether cloud or convection will grow deep is whether the atmosphere that the parcel encounters is unstable or whether it is stable. That's the key thing. And then one, okay, so take home messages before you fall asleep and I'll take a question. So again, deep clouds, it's mainly dictated whether by um, whether the parcel encounters unstable or stable profiles. And then for the shallow clouds, one thing to know is that if you're lower in the atmosphere, you have uh, several destabilizing mechanisms. We, we um, have radiation. We already mentioned that radiation um, any parcel of air will emit radiation and cool radiatively. Oh, okay, sorry. <coughs> yes, 
Nimbo Nimbus means it rain. Yeah. So it's not surprising that the deeper clouds are the ones that have the strongest precipitation. These guys have can have some precipitation as well, but it's not as strong. And and the reason is <coughs> actually if you um, you can actually uh, separate precipitation into stratiform or convective, and one of the one of the criterion is the speed of the updrafts. If the speed of the updrafts is weak, weaker than the ice terminal velocity, then it's going to be stratiform precipitation, and it shows differently in radars. And so what happens is that actually the ice or precipitation falls, but the updrafts are not strong enough to make them go up, and so they just fall slowly to the ground. These guys have vertical velocities faster than terminal velocities. And so even if the hydrometeors are trying to fall, they can't fall unless they grow really large. And so the, the rain that comes out of those convective clouds um, are larger hydrometeors because they have to be larger to make it to the ground. So it's not surprising, yes. That's associated with the physics behind it. Um, OK, so then I should take the other question. There was another question. It's okay. Um, <coughs> yeah. So one last thing before I go into the details. There are uh, so we saw latent heat helps the convection, and there's something else. There's radiative cooling at the top of the clouds. There's lots of emitters in the cloud, and so they tend to cool a lot because they emit a lot of long wave radiation. And when you cool the top, that tends to also help convection. It's, dis it's destabilizing the layer. And so. In the upper level clouds, we saw there's not a lot of water vapor. So the leading order will be the radiative cooling, so the destabilization. Right? Latent heat is very small. There's not a lot of water vapor. Here, latent heat can is quite large, and actually radiative cooling as well. So that's the main difference between those shallow clouds and those ones. These ones are actually a mixture, pretty much. Okay, so that's a very brief overview. <coughs> um, Oh yeah, before I switch to shallow clouds, I wanted to mention for deep clouds um, other lifting mechanisms. We saw the instability of a parcel either if you force it mechanically or if you make it moister or if you make it actually warmer, you're going to help it go up. <coughs> but you have other cases, orography, we've already talked about it. You can have large scale convergence that's going to help. So for instance, if you have a cold pool coming and shear, wind shear on the other side, that can help a new cell uh, convect. And you have fronts. So I'm biased because I mainly work in the tropics and I tend to forget about the extra tropics. But here I thought I should mention this. I think we've seen this before. Um, but fronts are, in the extra tropics, a very efficient way to give convection, to rise mechanically air. And as we saw, you have the cold front here, which is, again, a, a cold air mass advancing into warmer air. And it's, it's quite fast, it's quite vertical, and that leads to strong uh, vertical convection as the warm air is lifted to its lifted condensation level and starts to convect. <coughs> okay, shallow clouds. Um, so I'll go through the different types of shallow clouds and then we'll discuss the physical processes behind. Okay, I won't go into tons of details, but I want to give you the leading order picture of why different clouds form and how. So fog and stratus, it's actually one case where they occur um, in a stable atmosphere, so mainly in the boundary layer, obviously. Um, the boundary layer is stable, and you just reach saturation because you make it cooler. And we've all experienced fog. Usually when there's fog, it's not super warm, right? And that's because um, it's been cooling either by radiation or because the surface is very cold. You cool the air near the ground, it's full, it's full of water vapor, and so it's going to reach more easily its saturation. It's stable. It's not raining, it's just condensing because you're cooling the air. So it's, like it's, it's a stable layer of air that you cool. So basically, you go towards the dew point until you reach it. And that's what we have dew in the morning. Since it's been cold at night, it's been radiatively cooling from the ground, if there's no cloud above, at least. And so you have fog formation, or you can have. Okay. Um, then shallow clouds that are those uh, those uh, stratus, stratocumulus, and cumulus. 
And so here you do have an unstable uh, boundary layer, but the atmosphere above is stable. Okay, and that's key to know whether it's going to stay shallow or grow deep. Um, and I've mentioned uh, the inversion layer earlier. If you Google inversion layer, actually, you find a lot of pollution images, and that's because it's very important for pollution, obviously. If you have an inversion layer, um, a thermal will not make it through this inversion layer. It's very stable, and we it will spread and, and um, stay on whatever uh, habitations you have, and it can be uh, quite dangerous. Um. Okay, and so... Um, how is the uh, boundary layer unstable? You have heating from below, and you have radiating, uh, radiative cooling from the top of the cloud. And both heating below and cooling above make the uh, destabilize the atmosphere, the boundary layer. <coughs> okay, so when do we have an inversion layer? Well, interesting. Especially, I'm interested in the large scales. Now, we already said that, but if you have a high pressure system in for instance, in the subtropics, in the descending branch of the Hadley cell, in those uh, high-pressure systems, you have um, adiabatic, adiabatic warming, and so the air aloft is very warm, it's very stable. <coughs> and then you, you tend to have cool air near the surface, and that will generate a um, very stable vertical profile. Oh, another place where you can have a, an inversion is a frontal inversion, when you have warm air, and then you have a cold, um, a cold front, coming in, then that's very stable. And then if for some reason you start having some convection, so either from pollutants or, or just because you have convection within this boundary layer, it's going to convect, but it's never going to make it through the warm air, very hardly. <coughs> and so that explains why we mainly saw those clouds, um, the shallow clouds in the subtropics, where you have this descending branch of the Hadley cell. The, you have a very strong inversion there, and so the convection stays shallow. Um, and then in the middle and high latitudes, you can also see them when you have air that comes from ice, um, ice uh, continents. Uh, the air is very cold, and it, um, it can flow with warm air above. Okay, so one thing I want to mention, is that clear? I know, yes? Okay, so shallow means uh, there's an inversion above. And there's one thing I want to mention about those cl clouds because it's quite, uh, it's quite spectacular, actually, the way they organize at the mesoscales. Does anyone know what they look like at the mesoscales? They organize into, um, they can organize into open and closed cells. You can have isolated stratocumulus, but especially west of continents, they would uh, organize into open and closed cells. I I'll show you a global distribution later. And this is quite striking. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so a closed cell is uh, defined as a cell where you have cloudy, uh, a shallow cloud in the middle and then dry air around. And so here, this is moving, it's not very convenient, but here you do see that there's cloud-free circle with cloud in the middle. It's not exactly a circle. You see what I mean? And then open cell is when it's the opposite. You have the clouds at the boundary, at the edge, and you have clear air in the center. And it's, uh, first, it's quite beautiful, I think. Um, it's also striking how abrupt the transition is between those two. And it's interesting because we don't fully understand it yet, and it's always interesting when we don't understand something, I think. Uh, but there are some processes that play a role. So you have uh, the background shear, the thermal instabilities in the boundary layer, the uh, cloud top entrainment, so the fact that you have radiative cooling at the top of the cloud, which destabilizes the top of the cloud and that generates turbulence, entrainment of air from the upper levels. And then the cold pools play a role, and I've recently seen a talk where they were discussing aerosols, the impact of, of aerosols from, from continents on this organization. Um, and in the global distribution, this is how at least what I found in House Book, I don't know if that's, this has been revisited more recently, not a specialist of shallow convection. Well, I don't directly work on it. But the open cells tend to be more uh, on these sides of the ocean than the closed cells where you have colder temperatures. So the open cells will, see, will sit on warm temperatures. You recognize here the place where you have the Gulf Stream. And all the upwelling regions is where you have more the closed cells. 
ocean upwelling, I mean, so the place where the sea surface temperature is cold. <coughs> so there seems to be a correlation. Another thing is maybe that reminds you of something. Something it looks like something. Look yes, thank you, Relebenar. So um, it does look like Relebenar convection, doesn't it? Um, this is an image from an experiment. So if you don't know about Relebenar convection, it's convection between two plates. Um, and you have a temperature difference between the bottom and the top. And if the temperature difference is sufficient, you start having those rolls. And it's really nice because you can get those very symmetrical mathematical patterns that emerge. And it's self-organizing. It's just emerging from the equations. And I did find, so the movie doesn't always work, yes. So I, do have I did find a video online of, oops, not this one, yep. Of a person who did this apparently in his garden with some, uh, ah, it's not on the right screen. <coughs> right. So there might be better videos, but I thought that would be a cool experiment that you can probably do outside of your, um, maybe not here, because I think it's some dangerous liquid actually that he uses, but at home in your garden. And so here he just puts this at the sun and that hits the bottom, I believe. And there's also cooling at the top just because of evaporative cooling, so latent cooling. And that generates those convective cells. It's not as symmetric, obviously, because this is not a perfect experiment, as you imagine. But uh, you do get the idea of the dynamics and why it goes into those cells. Yes, very good transition, thank you. Perfect. Um, so it's tempting, it is tempting to say that it looks like it, but actually, I don't know where I am. Yeah. So it's tempting to think that maybe sh uh, shallow and close cells are somewhat linked to the relevant R convection, but actually um, I think people have discarded this because, well, first of all, the mechanisms are not the same. It's not only heated at the bottom, but you have radiative cooling at the top. It's a similar idea. You have an unstable layer between two stable layers, but in, um, um, in the atmosphere, the aspect ratio is not the same, not the one that you expect theoretically from Rayleigh Benar. So although it does look similar, it looks like the, the fact that the physical processes behind are not the same does not make the similarity uh, very relevant. But I just thought it was nice to show this because I think it's something very uh, striking, a, a nice example of self-organization of a system. Okay, and I'll end with uh, <coughs> the shallow layer clouds at higher and uh, middle levels. I'll start with the highest because, as mentioned at the beginning, the lowest have radiative cooling and latent heat contributing. The highest have mainly radiation, and the middle ones are somewhat in between. Because you still have some water vapor, but the radiation is increasingly important. Okay, so for the higher level clouds, as mentioned, there's not much water vapor. And it's similar to the shallow clouds at the bottom, except that now it's a, an unstable layer between two stable layers, okay, instead of being the surface and one stable layer alone. Um, and it's mainly the radiation. What does the radiation look like? The short wave is pretty much um, heating throughout the cloud, but the long wave is mainly cooling above the cloud and warming below. Okay, and again, it's uh, warming below because if you're below the cloud, you have more emitters above you, so you receive more long wave. And if you're above the cloud, you're emitting more to space by the same reason. So if you look at the radiative cooling profile, a typical signature of a cloud is a warming below and a um, cooling above. That's what you see typically. Okay, and when do they form? There's various ways. They can be detrained by those uh, deep convection events. So we saw those anvil clouds spreading. <coughs> Um, and that's probably most often the case. And um, the reason why we think it's probably most often the case is because the um, largest series cover is in the tropics and in the extra tropics where you have deep convection. And so sources of those anvil clouds. But they can also be formed uh, in an unstable layer aloft. And th for the middle clouds, so they can also be generated by other clouds. So they can be remnants of other clouds as a, as a, um, uh, horizontal wind varies. You can have um, detrainment of hydrometeors at middle levels, and that would give rise to an altus cloud. 
um, sometimes they actually have uh, properties of a high altitude convective cloud. Okay, there is still some water vapor, so you do have latent heat helping. So you can have some vertical extent for those clouds, and um, they can also resemble the radiatively driven mixed layer or, or high clouds. So mainly by radiation, radiative cooling at the top of the cloud, leading to an unstable profile and helping the convection. Okay, and they also organize at the large scales, but I can't show everything, so um, I'll let you uh, go to the various references if you're more interested in those clouds. And um, I want to at least finish this part, and then we go to convective organization a little bit, um, by talking about other instabilities that are actually relevant. So we talked about convective instability in the dry and in the moist case. We even saw relevant our convection, at least visually. There are other types of instabilities which are fascinating. Um, so the Kelvin Helmholtz, you all know that, they're relevant for clouds because very often you get pictures of clouds in shear layers that form those rolls. And we won't go through the details of this because that's not the topic of the lecture, but I thought I would show this experiment. Um, so this is actually a video from Cambridge University and they have a large tank um, with salty, heavy water here and fresh water here. Some of you might have seen this experiment, I guess. At least at the FDIC Cambridge Summer School, you've seen this. So they um, tilt the tank and what's going to happen if you do that? If you tilt the tank with a, a heavy liquid. So the heavy liquid will flow towards the bottom and the light liquid will flow up. And so you have a stratification or an interface <coughs> with shear, right? The bottom level we go down and the upper level we go up. And if you have shear and stratification, that's the perfect recipe for Kelvin Helmholtz instability. And this is what it looks like. They create the shear. You have the current forming here, here. So the kinetic energy is trying to destabilize things, bringing turbulence, and this stratification stabilizes. See, this is, I knew you would like this. I think this is really uh, impressive. It looks easy, but actually I visited this lab and to get the actual roll perfectly aligned, they have some tricks. They put tape at the bottom with the right wavelength, which is the most unstable <laughs> wavelength. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this actually, but, but you see how they get the perfect wavelength. And, uh, anyway. All right, and um, these are some pictures that they probably found. And the last thing, so we had this this morning, I had to add a slide. Uh, I, I took a picture, but I couldn't connect to the internet. So this is not the actual picture from this morning. This is the one we saw earlier. Um, and I had also a discussion uh, um, of a breakfast with uh, um, Nick Peltier about Lee waves. And so I thought I'd mention this. So we saw a lenticular cloud over the Mont Blanc this morning. What has happened now? Try to discuss physically, what do you think was happening over this mountain? Anyone? Yeah, there's probably some large scale flow that hit the mountain, then it went up, and then the sponge was full, started to saturate. Um, at least it had a cloud, and then it went down. See this? So, um, see how the clouds are are um, extremely lenticular, very um, thin very soft, actually. They don't have all this turbulent motion that you would expect if there was some vertical motion or instability. And the reason why they are so strikingly soft and, and uh, horizontal is because they're actually associated with the generation of atmospheric waves. And I wanted to clarify this because someone asked, <coughs> sorry, whether this was related to a vertical, uh, maybe wavelength. I said no, but then I said that it's associated with a wave that is actually um, horizontal though. And I hope that was clear. So I want to emphasize this again. When you have flow over a mountain, you generate oscillations of the isopixels. And the lenticular clouds are actually embedded in these. And that's why they look so uh, thin and so um, the edge is so sharp. So sharp is the word I was looking for. Because they are, they are associated with very coherent large scale oscillations in the waves. And if you have more questions, I'll refer you to <laughs> Dick Peltier, who wrote a lot of papers on this. Yes? 
Yes, that's why I drew another one. Sometimes you see them. And actually, this morning, I saw one behind the Mont Blanc, I think. So you had one, and then you had another one behind. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so within this, what happens is if here, say, I had Q a QV profile, which was very noisy, then the cloud will only be where you've reached saturation. So you can have a stack within the wave. Yes, to have a uh, to have a wave, the restoring force for internal waves is the stratification. Yes, it goes up because it's stratified; it encounters um, lighter fluid and it goes back down. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you have different flow regimes, and again, I refer you to a specialist sitting right behind you. <laughs> Uh, there are different flow regimes. You can have hydraulic jumps, you can have lots of interesting things behind the mountain. We're discussing a few of these at, at breakfast. Uh, you could have a lee wave breakfast if you want tomorrow morning, discussing all those things. But you can even have the clouds before or after. So the, the fruit number is an important non-dimensional parameter for the flow regime you're in. Yeah. Um, yes, so it's a very rich phenomenon. Yeah. OK, any more questions? So it's time to go to the next lecture in the 15 minutes we have left. <laughs> um, that's OK. We, we'll go as far as we can. So um, I want to talk about the organization of, of uh, deep convection at larger scales. And Antoine has already asked um, about the mesoscale organization at larger scales. And I, I put it in a separate lecture because it's much more controversial than everything I said so far. So those two lectures that you just had are textbook type of lectures. Um, you can find them in you know, the books that I gave you. Now we're moving towards more controversial things, why uh, we care about clouds, and what are the open questions. And in fact, I'll do it reversely. I'll first give you the open questions, and then I'll explain why we care about them, their impact for climate. OK, so organization of clouds at the mesoscale. First, I'll uh, introduce you to those things, so mesoscale convective systems. Um, meso so mesoscale convective systems, as I already told you, is a generic term for all the organization at mesoscale that satisfies certain criteria. Um, and that includes the mesoscale convective complexes, which have an additional criteria that they have to be somewhat circular. Squall lines, which are lines of precipitation. Tropical cyclones, you know what that is. And then we'll talk about the different processes leading to those, or believed to be leading to those mesoscale organization. As I said, not everything is known. And I should add that not everything is known for technical reasons, I think, actually. Um, in order to study clouds and convection, you need to have sim numerical, if you want to do numerical simulation um, studies, you need to have numerical simulations that resolve the convection, not the microphysics, that's impossible, that's too small. But at least if you have you know, maybe the resol uh, resolution of one kilometer, you can say that you decently resolve the deep clouds. Not the shallow clouds, but the deep clouds, they're large enough. So we are usually happy with a kilometric resolution or so. But so that's, yep. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. Thank you, you're always asking the good questions when I, um, yes. Uh, microphysics means all the things that happen with droplets. How do the droplets uh, form? How do they grow within the cloud? We mentioned that when the updraft speed is very large, the droplets have a hard time uh, reaching the ground because their terminal velocities are not sufficient. So they stay in the cloud a long time, grow large, and then you have those big hail coming to the ground. That's microphysics, the interaction. The, so it's micro length and uh, very small scale physics. Interaction with of uh, droplets, how they grow, how they break, how the eye forms, etc. Um, but so, so for the study of clouds, we parameterize the microphysics, so we have simple models for that. It's not perfect, but we're happy with that so far. And um, kilometric resolution. That means that if you want to study the organization at mesoscale, you need to have a domain which is large enough to have a cyclone. And that's very expensive. Even now, actually, it's hard to have a cyclone in a cloud-resolving simulation. 
And that has been a limitation for a while, and now we're just at the moment where you can do both. You can have resolve the deep clouds and have their organization at the mesoscale. It's actually an exciting moment, an exciting moment in this field. Maybe that's why a lot of people have been interested in this. Um, okay, so this is from the first lecture. Just to remind you, we saw that there are um, degrees of organization at mesoscales. This might actually not be the best visualization. This one was better. This is the Havmuller diagram of outgoing long wave radiation. And you see those packets, which uh, are small mesoscale pulsations of the signal, which are ubiquitous mesoscale convective systems. And I've already showed you pictures of this and an animation over Eastern Europe. Um, but as I said, they're ubiquitous. You can find them in uh, both hemispheres. And, um, and I, I actually told you we'd see more in lecture three, so that's now. Um, and Okay, so here I just so want to remind you, although we just, did, we just did it, so you probably remember, this is the uh, life cycle of an individual thunderstorm. Okay, so you have one updraft, and then you have the, the anvil cloud, the dissipating stage. And so from that, how do we define, what do we mean by organized convection? How does it differ from this? With multiple cells, uh, even more than this. Even the multiple cell or the super cell do not always qualify as mesoscale system. And to be a mesoscale system, you need to, so before giving you numbers, the idea is that it has to last longer than in an individual thunderstorm. And it has to cover also a large area. So it has to have a long um, autocorrelation in time and in space. Um, and so what are the various things that give rise to organization? It can be actually forced by a large-scale condition. So for instance, if you have an island, you, I don't know if you know Hector the Convector. It's a very famous uh, strong thunderstorm north of Australia on an island. It's very reproducible, so it's a really nice uh, place to do experiments because every day you have this huge convective thunderstorm that forms. It's called Hector the Convector. If you want to Google that, there's very nice animations. So you have an island or SST gradient, which can force actually a sort of mesoscale organization. But more interestingly, um, it can, so it can also be interaction with the vertical shear, we've seen that. But more interestingly, in recent years, people have focused a lot on, on internal feedbacks. So without any large scale forcing, without any large scale um, wind, you can still have clouds organizing. And so people have, uh, studied various feedbacks, and we will go through this. So you have moisture feedbacks, you have gravity waves, um, and then you have a self-aggregation feedback, which is probably by far the most controversial, but that's what I, I work on, so I'll talk about it. S and it's still very much an area of research. Yeah. So I would put it in the, yes, you can have upscale uh, growth. Um, an upscale cascade, five minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so now the precise definition with the actual numbers. So a mesoscale convective system is a cloud system that occurs in connection with an ensemble of thunderstorms and produces a contiguous precipitation area of the order of 100 kilometers. So remember, mesoscale is hundreds of kilometers to the atmosphere. And so 100 kilometers or more in horizontal scale in at least one direction. And sometimes they are called cloud clusters, cloud aggregates, but the real uh, jargon is MCS. Now the MCS is uh, include mesoscale convective complexes, so it's a subset of systems that exhibit uh, a large circular long-lived cold cloud shield. So the difference is mainly that a con uh, MCC is circular. So the an the satellite um, animation we saw over Eastern Europe. It was roughly circular, this was an MCC. <coughs> and so the cloud shield has to satisfy certain properties. Um, and in fact, I forgot that I put this, but <coughs> this is an MCS, so you have a large uh, distribution, a lot of thunderstorms embedded in this system. And again, this is an MCC, so the circularity 
uh, is clear. <coughs> and a hurricane is also uh, an example of MCS. This is Hurricane uh, Floyd approaching Florida. Okay, and yeah, is there a question? And so um, how do they contribute to the precipitation? Well, you can imagine that these are quite extreme events and they do contribute to a very large fraction of the precipitation in the tropics, about 80% in uh, some areas. So they contribute to a significant portion of the precipitation. Um, okay, and so kind of a motivation. So what are the processes that will lead to the formation of those um, things and we'll just cover the first one which is the squall line um, and we've already seen that when you have a uh, cloud in the dissipating stage you have down drafts and you have cold pools and if a background wind shear is present which is the case to the right the background wind shear can interact with the propagating cold pool and generate a new cell Okay, and now I want to talk a little bit about the details of the processes. There's uh, two theories actually for that, <coughs> at least two theories that I could find in the literature. Um, oh, I forgot to say, the score lines uh, look like this. So they're quite spectacular actually. They look like those very long arched uh, cloud covers. And so where do they come from? <coughs> if you have a background uh, mean wind, there's two theories. So one of them says that actually it's the, the background wind advex the cold pool away from the convection. So what happens? You have your convective cloud rising, and actually convective clouds kill themselves by creating their downdrafts. That's the way to kill the cloud. So the cloud is uh, rising, and then it kills itself with its downdraft. But now what happens if you move the downdraft away? It could keep rising as long as it's still buoyant. Okay, and so what happens, or this, uh, proposed theory is that the displacement of the downdraft compared to the updraft is what helps those systems live longer. Okay, because they can't kill themselves. You remove the cold pool. Um, the other theory, yeah? Oh, yeah, so, um, do I have the animation still? Yes. What I mean is here, the cloud is formed, it creates its large hydrometeors that fall, and that creates a downward motion. And we all know that clouds do not like downward motion. That kills the cloud. Okay, so if you, if you, if you didn't have those downdrafts, presumably the updraft could stay there much longer. But the fact that you have, oh, what has happened? PowerPoint stopped. So I guess it's time to stop it. Yeah, so the, the, the cloud, um, as it creates its downdraft, uh, opposes the upward motion that started it, and that's going to be the end of the, of the cloud. Yes. But, but to keep the hydrometeors there, to keep bringing, you know, they're going to be exported and there's uh, envelope clouds created, you need to keep bringing moisture, otherwise the cloud will dissipate. Yeah. And so the downdraft is um, stopping the influx of moisture from the bottom. Okay, so I guess I'll stop here and we'll continue next time.